You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Hey everyone, welcome to the 69th episode of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Thanks for tuning in to the podcast. As y'all will recall, we ended the last episode with Sterling Price and the Missouri State Guard's victory at Lexington in September 1861 quickly coming unraveled as news of a large federal army advancing from St. Louis meant that Price ordered the State Guard to leave Lexington and fall back all the way to Neosho in southwest Missouri. And here at the start of this episode, we wanted to briefly explain or shed some light on something we mentioned at the end of the last show. So at the end of the last show, we said that Sterling Price and the State Guard retreated to Neosho where a rump Missouri legislature passed an ordinance of secession in late October 1861. And we said that they did that despite the fact that the civil government in Missouri was still firmly on the side of the Union. Well, to understand what we meant by all of that, you have to go back to Nathaniel Lyon's seizure of Jefferson City, the state capital, back in June. You guys may remember how we said that prior to Lyon's arrival there, Governor Claiborne Fox Jackson and uh, assorted legislators who, like him, were pro-Southern in their sympathies, they had fled Jefferson City and abandoned the machinery of state government. Well, what we didn't mention before is what happened in light of that development. What happened is kind of crazy, But the Secession Convention, of all things, reconvened itself in St. Louis. Well, So remember that earlier on, the voters of Missouri had sent Unionist delegates to the Secession Convention, and so the convention had refused to take the state out of the Union. And now, with the governor having fled from the state capitol, the Secession Convention reconvened in the safer confines of St. Louis, and it declared the state offices vacant, and then it appointed a loyal, or i.e. pro-union governor, and the secession convention became the de facto provisional state government of Missouri. Needless to say, that provisional pro-union state government that was set up in the summer of 1861 under Governor Hamilton R. Gamble was supported by the Lincoln administration. But Claiborne Fox Jackson and the rump or minority legislature in exile that met down in southwest Missouri was officially recognized by the Confederacy, and so that explains why the state had a star on the Confederate flag. It also helps explain why Missouri remained such a mess during most of the rest of the Civil War and even beyond the war years, torn apart by internal strife and turmoil and violence. Okay, so we just wanted to briefly explain about the convoluted political situation in Missouri after the start of the war, Uh, but now that we've taken care of that, we want to turn our attention for the rest of the episode to John C. Fremont, because in late July 1861, five days before Hamilton Gamble assumed his duties as acting governor, John C. Fremont arrived in St. Louis and assumed overall command of what was at that time the Western Department, which embraced a massive area. Uh, That federal department took in Illinois 
and all states and territories west of the Mississippi River and east of the Rocky Mountains, as well as New Mexico. So that was an enormous area of responsibility, but it was actually troubled Missouri that proved to be Fremont's undoing. In July of 1861, when he arrived in St. Louis, John C. Fremont was a nationally known figure, but he soon proved he lacked both the experience and the ability to cope with the challenging military situation and the complex political problems that awaited him in Missouri. Fremont was 48 years old when he took command in St. Louis in the summer of 1861. He had earned fame as the Pathfinder for leading major explorations into Western territories as a topographical engineer in the Army during the 1830s and 1840s. Those expeditions laid out the paths for the Oregon Trail and the California Trail, but although Fremont proved to be a brilliant explorer, he unfortunately also demonstrated an arrogant disposition and a flair for self-promotion, which was an unpleasant mixture of disagreeable character traits and meant that John C. Fremont had no talent for leadership. During America's war with Mexico, Fremont had taken part in the California Bear Flag Revolt against Mexican rule, and chiefly due to his heroic reputation, he was selected to be acting governor of the area. But then when he subsequently refused to surrender that position to the Army officer Washington sent out to officially establish a territorial government, Fremont was court-martialed and dismissed from the service for insubordination. But Fremont stayed on in California, struck gold, made a fortune, lost it, and then in 1849 he was elected one of the first two U.S. Senators from the new state. As longtime listeners to the podcast will remember, uh, Fremont was then the Republican Party's very first presidential candidate. He was defeated in the 1856 campaign by James Buchanan, the Democratic nominee. Now, in many ways, Fremont was an inept candidate, uh, really ill-suited to carry a political party's banner on the national stage. But nevertheless, although he lost the election, Fremont did carry most of the northern states, and his run for the presidency undeniably helped pave the way for Abraham Lincoln's victory in 1860. And so at the start of the Civil War, among Republicans, Fremont was still a popular figure and retained widespread support. So it was because of Fremont's martial reputation, such as it was, and because of his considerable political influence, that Lincoln appointed him commander of the Western Department. In 1841, Fremont had married Jesse Benton, the young, beautiful, headstrong daughter of Missouri's powerful U.S. Senator Thomas Hart Benton. So Fremont had close ties to Missouri even before he arrived to take command of the Western Department in the summer of 1861. In fact, the Blair family, who were political allies and friends of Thomas Hart Benton, had played a key part in persuading Abraham Lincoln to give Fremont a major general's commission and the important command at St. Louis. Y'all will recall how we said back in episode number 64 that the Blairs were major movers and shakers in Missouri politics and in the Republican Party. In St. Louis, Frank Blair Jr., whose connections in Washington included a brother as Lincoln's postmaster general and a father as an advisor to the president, while Frank Blair Jr. had been Nathaniel Lyon's foremost cheerleader, and now Blair was Fremont's main ally in Missouri. But from almost the moment Fremont arrived in St. Louis on July 25th, things began to go wrong. First, there was the federal defeat at Wilson's Creek on August 10th and Nathaniel Lyon's death during the battle. As you guys know, Lyon had appealed to Fremont for reinforcements, but the new department commander's attention was focused on Confederate threats along the Mississippi River, and so Fremont told Lyon that no reinforcements were available, and he urged Lyon to retreat from Springfield to the railhead at Rolla if he felt he couldn't hold his position. But Lyon recklessly decided to attack the rebels at Wilson's Creek, and after he was killed during the fighting on Bloody Hill, he was widely proclaimed as a hero in the North, 
while Fremont was criticized for not having given Lyon the support he requested. Perhaps Fremont, newly installed in his command, shouldn't have been held responsible for Nathaniel Lyon's recklessness. However, no one but Fremont himself can be blamed for his poor relationship with Missouri's civil authorities. While acting Governor Hamilton Gamble struggled to deal with the chaos into which Missouri was rapidly descending, Fremont seemed to go out of his way to undermine Gamble's efforts rather than supporting them. From his headquarters mansion, where he surrounded himself with old cronies and an entourage of pompous toadies supporting sumptuous uniforms and high-flown titles, Fremont was openly contemptuous of the state's civilian authorities. One Army officer recalled that men who urgently needed to see Fremont found it, quote, more trouble than it would be to get an audience with the Tsar of Russia, end quote. Word quickly began to filter back to Washington describing the new department commander's political ineptitude, military incompetence, and high-handed behavior. At the end of August, in what looked like a desperate bid to save himself from a rising chorus of criticism, Fremont made a major political blunder. He issued an order on August 30th that placed Missouri under martial law, proclaimed the death penalty for captured guerrillas, and confiscated the property and freed the slaves of all Confederate sympathizers in the state. Now, there were many who thought that the imposition of martial law might be a good idea while Gamble and his allies were scrambling to construct a legitimate state government in Missouri but there were not many people who thought it was prudent to go around executing Confederate prisoners, since the threat of execution invited retaliation in kind. And knowing this, Abraham Lincoln ordered Fremont to execute no one without the president's consent. But the most controversial part of Fremont's edict was the emancipation of rebel-owned slaves. Abraham Lincoln was not pleased with Fremont's proclamation regarding the slaves of rebellious Missourians. As James McPherson explains in his book, Tried by War, Abraham Lincoln as Commander-in-Chief, quote, For the past five months, the administration had been walking a tightrope on the sensitive issue of slavery. Lincoln's national strategy of maximizing support for the war would be jeopardized by any sign of an anti-slavery policy. A war to restore the Union united the North. A war against slavery would divide it. Border State Unionists and Northern Democrats were suspicious of the Republican Party's designs on slavery. The strategy of conciliation of the presumed silent majority of Unionists in the Confederate States would also be wrecked by the first hint of an emancipation policy. Lincoln had lost some faith in that silent majority, but he very much wanted to keep Democrats and Border State Unionists in his war coalition. End quote. In other words, Lincoln had a political purpose to serve with his insistence in 1861 that the war was meant to preserve the Union rather than to destroy slavery. It's important to realize that at this point in time, in 1861, early in the war, Abraham Lincoln's main concern in the Western theater of the war was Kentucky. In fact, in September, he would write in a letter to a friend that, quote, I think to lose Kentucky is nearly the same as to lose the whole game, end quote. As we've mentioned previously, Missouri and Kentucky were both important slave-owning border states, and the populations of both states were deeply divided in their sympathies. But at the start of the Civil War, while Missouri almost immediately descended into chaos and turmoil and conflict, Kentucky declared itself neutral. And in 1861, early in the war, both Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis, while they both longed for Kentucky to side with them, they both decided to bide their time and, more or less, respect the state's self-proclaimed neutrality, since rocking the boat would likely only drive the bluegrass state into the arms of the enemy. And Abraham Lincoln realized that Fremont's Emancipation Proclamation in Missouri would very likely rock the boat over in Kentucky, causing Kentuckians to question whether the purpose of the war was really to preserve the Union, as Lincoln said, or whether the true goal was to destroy slavery. 
In July, a month before Fremont's edict, a majority of Republicans had supported Lincoln's stated policy when all but a handful of them voted for a resolution sponsored by U.S. Representative John J. Crittenden of Kentucky and Senator Andrew Johnson of Tennessee. And by the way, Johnson was the only senator from a seceded state who remained loyal to the Union. Uh, But anyway... But anyway, that resolution sponsored by Crittenden and Johnson affirmed that the war was being fought not for the purpose, quote, of overthrowing or interfering with the rights or established institutions of those states, end quote, but only, quote, to defend and maintain the supremacy of the Constitution and to preserve the Union, end quote. So early in the war, here in 1861, you have the president saying the war was being prosecuted in order to preserve the Union, not to destroy slavery, and you have a Republican-controlled Congress passing a resolution in support of that policy. Now, as James McPherson points out in Tried by War, some cracks had started to appear in that policy by the time of Fremont's edict. The first crack we've mentioned already on the podcast, it was when Benjamin Butler, in command of the Union toehold on the peninsula down in Virginia, it was when Butler decided to no longer enforce the fugitive slave law. Instead, when slaves escaped to Union lines near Fort Monroe, Butler declared them contraband of war and refused to return them to their Confederate owners. Butler notified the War Department of his actions and requested approval. Lincoln and the Cabinet discussed the matter on May 30th and sanctioned Butler's contraband policy. Another crack appeared only two weeks after the Crittenden-Johnson resolution when Congress passed a Confiscation Act that authorized the seizure of all property, including slaves, used in military aid of the rebellion. President Lincoln signed the bill without comment. So, there were cracks appearing in the policy, but Fremont's blanket order declaring all slaves owned by Confederate sympathizing Missourians to be free went considerably beyond either Butler's contraband policy or Congress's Confiscation Act. Fremont's edict would have emancipated the slaves whether or not they were being used in support of the rebellion and regardless of whether the slaves were inside Union lines. And, as Lincoln feared it would, Fremont's proclamation raised an instant outcry from those border state Unionists the President wanted to keep pacified. And so, fearing Fremont's decree would push Kentucky off the fence of neutrality and into the waiting arms of the Confederacy, on September 3rd, four days after Fremont declared martial law in Missouri, Lincoln wrote him a brief private note asking, not ordering, but asking the general to modify his order to conform to Congress's Confiscation Act. Any other officer would have treated the president's request as an order, and that would have been the end of it. But John C. Fremont sent his wife to Washington with a letter stating his refusal to modify the Emancipation Clause of his edict unless Lincoln directly ordered him to do so. Jessie Benton Fremont's arrogance apparently matched her husband's, because Abraham Lincoln, by his own admission, could barely control his anger when he met with the sharp-tongued woman. Jesse apparently dropped some not-so-subtle hints that her husband possessed superior wisdom and enjoyed greater prestige than did the president. As Lincoln later recalled the confrontation, quote, She sought an audience with me at midnight and taxed me so violently with many things that I had to exercise all the awkward tact I have to avoid quarreling with her, end quote. Well, needless to say... Mrs. Fremont's trip to Washington and that meeting with the president obviously did not help her husband's cause. And so, on September 11th, Lincoln ordered Fremont to modify his proclamation so that it conformed to the Confiscation Act recently passed by Congress. It's important to understand that Abraham Lincoln didn't object, generally, to martial law, property confiscation, or emancipation. But at this critical point of time in the war, the president did object to Fremont making sensitive political decisions 
that weren't properly the concern of the military. Or as Lincoln put it, Fremont's edict was, quote, not within the range of military law or necessity, end quote. Basically, Lincoln saw Fremont's ill-advised Emancipation Proclamation in Missouri to be a policy decision that was a threat to the Union's cause in Kentucky. And in Lincoln's mind, the issue at this point in the war was simple. If Kentucky sided with the Confederacy, Lincoln didn't believe that the North could win the war. And so the president stepped in and ordered Fremont to change his edict. Well, loyal border state men expressed approval of Lincoln's action, but the president was vigorously condemned by many Republicans for slapping down Fremont. Interestingly, this issue produced more letters to Lincoln, pro and con, than any other event of his presidency. This episode is brought to you by Paramount+. Plus. Get in, loser! Mean Girls is now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Join Katie Heron as she meets the plastics and Tina Fey's new twist on the modern classic. Get ready for more of the rumors, backstabbing, and jokes you loved from the original movie with some fetch surprises. Rated PG-13. Wear pink and head to ParamountPlus.com to try it free. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast, and we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Vyadaris, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Meanwhile, besides the controversy over his Emancipation Proclamation, Fremont also had to contend with Sterling Price's attack on Lexington and siege of that town, which we talked about in last week's episode. The reinforcements Fremont sent to relieve the Federals at Lexington were too few and too late, and the garrison surrendered on September 20th. With that disaster added to the earlier defeat at Wilson's Creek, many observers noted that in just two months of command, Fremont had managed to lose a substantial portion of Missouri to the enemy. But as for those alarming military setbacks occurring on Fremont's watch, James McPherson, in Tried by War, points out that they were, quote, not the worst of his perceived deficiencies. Fremont faced complex administrative problems without much help from Washington, a thousand miles away. War contracts had to be negotiated. Supplies, arms, horses, and wagons had to be obtained in a hurry. Gunboats for the River Navy had to be built. New recruits had to be organized and trained. Transport bottlenecks had to be overcome. And quarreling unionists kept in line. Fremont turned out to be a terrible administrator. Contractors cheated him. Many of his subordinates were corrupt. Reports of graft found their way to Washington. Fremont had pro-consular personality and an outsized ego. He surrounded himself with a large staff of German and Hungarian soldiers of fortune in gaudy uniforms who turned away many people who had legitimate business with the general. End quote. Fremont's arrogance, his incompetency, and his weakness for pomp offended the down-to-earth Midwesterners who visited his headquarters in St. Louis. Frank Blair Jr. quickly realized that Fremont was turning into a disaster. Blair, now a colonel in the army, wrote a letter to his brother, Lincoln's postmaster general, recommending Fremont's removal from command. When Fremont learned of this, he had Frank Blair arrested for insubordination. McPherson points out that, of all of Fremont's blunders, this was probably his worst mistake, because in Missouri... It was said of the Blairs that when they went in for a fight, they went in for a funeral. By this point, Fremont's days as commander of the Western Department were probably numbered, but he seemed to believe that a military victory could still save him, so Fremont wrote to General-in-Chief Winfield Scott that he was, quote, taking the field myself and hoped to destroy the enemy, end quote. 
Scott replied tersely that the president, quote, expects you to repair the disaster at Lexington without loss of time, end quote. Fremont left St. Louis in late September in pursuit of a climactic battle with Sterling Price's Missouri State Guard. He commanded an impressive force of 38,000 troops and 68 pieces of artillery organized into five divisions. Fremont initially moved toward Lexington, hoping to cut off Price's retreat from the town, but by that time, the State Guard was on the move as well. Faced with Fremont's advance with an overwhelmingly superior federal force and wishing to avoid being trapped at Lexington, Price evacuated the town on September 29th and continued retreating all the way to Neosho in the extreme southwestern corner of the state and beyond the immediate reach of Union forces. Fremont, learning of the enemy's departure from Lexington, followed in pursuit. But foul weather, swollen rivers, and inexperience slowed Fremont's progress, and he eventually broke off the chase. He instead turned his army towards Springfield, the largest town in southwest Missouri, and formerly Nathaniel Lyon's base of operations. As his army approached Springfield, Fremont sent his hand-picked personal bodyguard of 300 cavalrymen on ahead, and on October 25th, the men in their colorful uniforms, and led by their Hungarian-born commander, Major Charles Zagonyi, made a dramatic dash on the token force of untrained, poorly armed Missouri State Guardsmen encamped at the town. The cavalry troopers of Fremont's special bodyguard had smarted at being ridiculed and referred to as kid-glove soldiers by the rest of the army, and so they were eager to come to grips with the enemy and prove their worth as real fighting men. At Springfield, in a headlong charge against the Missouri State Guardsmen, Fremont's bodyguard proved their courage, but also suffered heavy casualties. They managed to scatter the enemy and secure Springfield, but Zagani realized his battered little command wouldn't be able to hold the town against a counterattack, and so he withdrew and retreated back to the main army. Well, the routed state guardsmen didn't return to the town in the meantime, but it was not until two days later, on October 27th, that the lead element of Fremont's army, a division commanded by none other than Franz Siegel, entered Springfield. The charge of the general's bodyguard and the Federal Army's march into Springfield were pretty much the climax of Fremont's campaign, such as it was. Most historians tend to agree with correspondent Frank Wilkie's assessment that Fremont's inadequately planned and poorly conducted campaign into southwest Missouri was, quote, the greatest humbug and farce in history, end quote. Once he arrived at Springfield, Fremont's intelligence was so poor that he believed Sterling Price's main force was only about 10 miles away, near Wilson's Creek again, when in reality, Price had the State Guard encamped at Neosho, 50 miles away. But while Fremont prepared to assault an enemy that was far beyond his reach, Abraham Lincoln's patience finally ran out. Besides having the Blair family actively working for his ouster, Fremont had also run afoul of a string of high-level delegations Lincoln had dispatched to St. Louis to investigate and sort out the mess in Missouri. All sent back reports not just critical of, but devastating to, Fremont. One member of the House Committee on Contracts wrote to Lincoln saying that, quote, The disclosure of corruption, extravagance, and peculation are utterly astounding. We think the evidence will satisfy the public that a most formidable conspiracy has existed here to plunder the government and that high-level officials have been prominently engaged in it. End quote. Three days after receiving that report, the president had Winfield Scott issue orders relieving Fremont of his command. Lincoln had finally concluded that Fremont was, quote, the prey of wicked and designing men, end quote and that Fremont had, quote, absolutely no military capacity, end quote. 
Fremont subsequently worked hard to erase the charges of incompetence and corruption that shadowed him, and in that effort, he had his supporters in a number of powerful radical Republicans who were annoyed that Lincoln hadn't supported Fremont's Emancipation Proclamation. They took up Fremont's cause and pressured the president so that Lincoln, in March 1862, will will reassign Fremont to command the Mountain Department in western Virginia. And as we'll see later on in the podcast, Missouri will be in constant turmoil throughout the war, as a particularly intense and bloody form of guerrilla warfare will take hold of the state and entire counties will be laid waste. But that's a story for future episodes. One final footnote as we wrap up this episode, and that's that just before he left the scene in Missouri, John C. Fremont did perform probably his greatest service for the Union cause. You see, an officer was needed to command the federal troops assembling at Cairo, Illinois, a strategically vital spot where the Ohio River joins the Mississippi River, and Fremont was conducting interviews to select the man to fill that important posting. The last officer he interviewed was a scruffy brigadier general who had left the regular army some years before under a cloud, and then here in 1861 had spent months trying to find his way into the war. But Fremont was impressed by this brigadier's determination and his quiet air of competency, and so Fremont gave him the Cairo command. That officer's name was Ulysses S. Grant. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is Pathfinder, John Charles Fremont and the Course of American Empire by Tom Chaffin. For those of you who want to learn more about Fremont's life, we recommend you check out Chaffin's biography of the famed Pathfinder. The book focuses mostly on Fremont's activities and exploits in the frontier west, before his run for the presidency, and then all of the Civil War hullabaloo that dogged him. So, especially if you're interested in reading about Fremont's expeditions to explore the West, then you should appreciate this biography. But anyway, you can find all of our book recommendations by going to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. We wanted to say thank you to Sam J. from Connecticut for his donation this past week. And also, thank you to everyone who has liked us on Facebook recently. We're inching closer to 500 likes, so Rich and I are excited about that milestone. Yeah, Facebook is still the number one way uh, you guys choose to get in touch with us. For example, this past week, Alan C., one of our listeners over in the UK, he messaged us to say he'd come across a mention of the use of observation balloons in the Civil War, and he asked if we were planning to tackle that topic on the podcast. Well, we said that since we do have one or two books on that subject sitting on uh, our bookshelves, we can almost guarantee that we'll get to it sometime. Anyway, uh, Tracy and I always enjoy hearing from you guys, whether it's on Facebook or through Twitter or by email. We appreciate the questions and the support and encouragement. So thank you to those of you who take the time to get in touch with us. And then thanks to all of y'all for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. We hope you'll join us again next week when we'll revisit the blockade and head to coastal North Carolina. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.